I'm Dick Clay. I'm the president and CEO of at least the last I heard for another, what, eight months uh, of the Filson Historical Society. And thank you so much for joining us for tonight's lecture. Uh, this is produced in partnership with the Jewish Heritage Fund, and we're grateful to them for their support. Um, now to the program. Arwen Donahue has served as program coordinator in the Department of Oral History at the United States Holocaust Museum and managed its post-Holocaust interview project. She is the author of Landings, a Crooked Creek Farm Year, uh, which is basically, I think, a memoir of your life in Nicholas County on the farm that you and your husband and, and child are all farming, uh, which is a story in and of itself. Um, Arwen is a, um, get my trifocals right here. Um, her drawing journal landings consist of 130 drawings and stories documenting daily life over the course of a year on this farm. Um, and several drawings are featured in the 2016 documentary, The Seer, a portrait of Wendell Berry. Uh, she's the author and illustrator of Old Man Gloom and has illustrated numerous books. So tonight you're in for, I, I think, a wonderful imaginative uh, and exciting adventure as we learn from Arwen Donahue about uh, a gripping and moving um, and altogether horrific and tragic um, event in this world's history. Arwen? Thank you all so much for coming out tonight and uh, braving the threat of storms and listening. And thanks to the Filson Society for inviting me here. So I started doing these interviews with Holocaust survivors in Kentucky in the mid 1990s when I was still living in DC and working for the Holocaust Museum. I was managing a, a project a Holocaust Museum oral history project for which we were interviewing survivors about their lives after the war. These were survivors that we had interviewed already about their wartime experiences. And we realized um, that naturally, uh, generally when people interview Holocaust survivors, we tend to ask them about their experiences during the war. And, and we realized that, that um, People's whole lives are not defined by those 12 or so years under Nazism, and that we um, would benefit greatly by asking more about what happened after the war. And so we had a team of interviewers all over the United States, and uh, they they went out and, and did, did interviews with people and sent them back to us. And then I moved to Kentucky. Um, because my husband and I bought a farm and um, I continued to work for the Holocaust Museum from Kentucky. And as I got to know my new home, I wondered, you know, how many Holocaust survivors live here? And how would I, I actually knew a couple of them because I had interviewed a couple of them when I was um, in Washington, DC. One of them lived in Winchester, Kentucky. Her name was Sylvia Green. And she had arrived, in, and you'll learn more about her in just, in just a few minutes. And another was named Robert Holzer, and he lived not very far from me on a farm also. He lived on a horse farm. He had lived in Germany for many years after the war and, and had lived all over the world. And I was fascinated that, that, uh, that, these, um, that these survivors had landed in Kentucky, and I, I wanted to know the full spectrum of their stories. And I also started digging into other 
regional Holocaust interview projects. And I found that often um, those projects were also similarly focused on people's wartime experiences. And I thought that that was a missed opportunity because um, here we have a chance to explore um, the role of place and community in rebuilding home and identity. And I didn't know of any projects that had really done that. And um, partially that's because most of the Holocaust survivor uh, oral histories that have been collected have been um, conducted with survivors who settled in New York City. And that's because two thirds of American Holocaust survivors roughly did settle in the New York metropolitan area. So by delving into these stories of survivors elsewhere, we can, we can learn something completely different. And um, so for me, this project was a way of getting to know my new home state and also um, meeting an extraordinary group of people. So at the end of World War II, about 140,000 Holocaust survivors uh, settled in the United States. I just realized I can't see on the screen, so I'm gonna have to... Most, yeah, this is just a summary of what I just said. They most settled in predominantly Jewish communities where they, ha they had access to not only um, their fellow Jews and cultural resources, and um, but also, in the case of New York City, many other Holocaust survivors. Um, and for many survivors, that was extremely important. And many survivors landed in New York, could continue to speak Yiddish with other Holocaust survivors and be among people who knew what they had been through. Um, and as I mentioned, those who settled in Kentucky encountered very different circumstances. Uh, in 2005, I um, uh, teamed up, the, my, the, the interviews were, by then the interviews were complete. Um, I'll say that uh, I had, backing up just a little bit, I had um, contacted Holocaust survivors around the state with the help of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's Registry of Jewish Holocaust Survivors and identified about 40 people um, who I got in touch with and ultimately, making a long story short, ended up interviewing 14 of those people. And um, by 2005, uh, I was approached by a friend of mine, a photographer named Rebecca Gail Howell, who thought you know, this, this would make a wonderful, these interviews would make a wonderful exhibit. And she offered to revisit the survivors and make uh, photographs. So in 2005, we launched an, an exhibit and um, it was at the Lexington History Museum. And it was, it was an extremely meaningful event, not only for the community of people who were able to go and meet the survivors, who all, all of whom attended the opening reception and spoke, but it was also an extremely meaningful and poignant occasion for the survivors themselves, because um, most of them had not met other Holocaust survivors in Kentucky before, and there was uh, there was a real sense of of coming together, and uh, it was so moving for me to witness um, Oscar Haber, who was the oldest survivor in the group, um, had been a dentist in Poland, was an adult when the war started, um, sitting in the corner with Robert Holzer, who was one of the youngest survivors. And they were just holding hands and leaning in close to each other and talking. Um, and there were that was just one story among among many. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that evening um, in a few minutes. So 
So the, it, uh, mainly what I want to do today is introduce you to some of the voices of these survivors, and I wish we could really delve in deeply and listen to them uh, for a long time, but we'll, we'll just um, we'll have a little bit here. Um, and but their, their experiences were very diverse, but they were all, as I say here, they're, they're, they were so resourceful. If they had something in common, it was their resourcefulness, their adaptability, and their willingness to call a place where little was familiar home. So this is Sylvia Green, who was born in Karlsruhe am Rhein, Germany in 1924. During World War II, she was imprisoned in the Krakow ghetto and the concentration camps Plashov, Auschwitz, and Bergen-Belsen, where she was liberated by British troops on April 15, 1945. In 1946, Sylvia and the surviving members of her family moved to Lexington, Kentucky, where they had relatives. Uh, she married Jake Green in 1949 and moved to the small town of Winchester. In 2010, Sylvia moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee to be near her daughter, and um, she, she passed away in 2017, sadly. So here, let's listen to Sylvia. Okay. There we go, there we go. The time he took us to uh, Munich, my brother was stationed in Munich. I think it was around October 45. I had a lot of living to do because I didn't live before. But uh, everybody felt that way. We ate too much, we drank too much. We just felt like a bird coming out of the cage. It's very overpowering. All, all that freedom. You were not told what to do. You could walk. You could go to bed when you wanted. You had nice beds and sheets. I mean, things you take for granted. People say, have you thought about going back to school? I said, no, I want so to. So then he took us to the uh, only thing. I mean, really, no, my brother was a life. I didn't have a teenage life. Okay, one more from Oops, one more from Sylvia. My brother said, "Listen, we're gonna make a home in Lexington, Kentucky. It's a beautiful little town. That way, we can be together. We don't have parents." My brother came in September, and we rented an apartment, thirty-five dollars rent. And they were nice enough to give me a job. It was worthwhile. They were Jewish people. And I think they gave me a job. They felt sorry for me. And then I was a novelty. I started up as wrapping packages. But that April, I just felt like stupid. You can do better than that, you know. So I started sneaking out and waiting on customers. And the customers loved it. Because I was a survivor, which they never met another one. Everybody knew about me. But I thought that was so striking that um, here's some this young woman, barely a teenager, well, she was a teenager, who arrives in Lexington, and she's the only Holocaust survivor, uh, or she and her family are the only Holocaust survivors in Lexington, and she has this job kind of a public job at a department store and people are just going in there because they want to see. And the, the term Holocaust survivor didn't even exist yet. You know, she was she was the refugee. They wanted to see the refugee. And uh, she was good humored enough to, to not hold that against anyone. So this is Paul Schlisser. He, and forgive my, anyone who's, Hungarian, my pronunciation. He was born in Almagest, Hungary in 1935 after the German invasion of Hungary in March of 1944. Paul was forced into a ghetto 
Later, he was imprisoned in the concentration camp Ravensbrück. In March of 1945, as the Allied front approached, Paul was sent to the camp Bergen-Belsen. There, his mother died weeks after the camp's liberation by British forces. And Paul lived in Israel before immigrating to the United States in 1959. And here in the US, he made a career in the army and served in the Vietnam War. In 1968, he was stationed in Fort Knox and he's remained in that community ever since. I've lost touch with Paul, but I, I believe he's still living. An old man gets shot right in front of me, an old guy with beard looked like my grandfather. On the march to Budapest, he couldn't walk, he was shouting, nothing. I was, you know, nothing do nothing good, and I, I can't, you know, I can deal with it. I can't live like that with, with the nightmare constantly on my mind. I stay behind me, I close it down as tight as I can close it down, and uh, that's it, you know. I feel that at least I got it going right, but it did happen. That it's not somebody's fantasy and it's not somebody, you know, made it up that people say that it didn't happen, that it did happen. And this was a theme that I encountered again and again. And anyone who interviews Holocaust survivors or survivors of trauma will encounter that. Um, well, not of any trauma, but particularly of the Holocaust, that it's very difficult to talk about it. And yet there's a sense of uh, the, bur the burden of speaking out that they have to speak because of Holocaust denial. That was my biggest motivation of joining the U.S. Army, is uh, I felt that the Russians weren't that much better than than the Nazis were. They had the gulags, they had the camps, they may not have been prosecuting Jews per se, but they were prosecuting human beings. That's basically what decided, you know, probably the only force in, in the world during this period of time that could prevent something like happening is the U.S. Armed Forces. And so that was my main reasoning for joining the service. I served in the Israeli army and fought in the Sinai Desert in 56. And 1966, I was sent to Vietnam. I was there in the Central Highlands for a year. And so I've been through the ringer. But Something inside of me drove me. I mean, what it was, I mean, I, I really couldn't put it to words. Uh, if anything that drove me, I guess, was duty, responsibility, duty, what I believe was right. And I, I thought that was so remarkable that um, one would expect that a Holocaust survivor would feel as if they had um, seen enough of fighting and war and had earned the right to to just live the rest of their lives out in peace. And of course, that's true. Um, but the fact that Paul was so so driven to um, to serve his country, uh, I found very impressive. So this is Ann Klein, for whom uh, the 2018 Ann Klein and Fred Gross Holocaust Education Act was named. Um, and she, is a, she was a Louisvillian. She was born in Eger, Hungary in 1921. In March of 1944, Germany invaded Hungary. And by May, Eger's Jews were forced to live in a ghetto. Weeks later, Anne and the ghetto's other inhabitants were loaded onto cattle cars and deported to Auschwitz, where Anne's parents were both killed. In January of 1945, Anne was force marched to the concentration camp Ravensbrück. She was imprisoned in two other camps before she was forced to march again. Anne was liberated by the American army in Wurzen, Germany. No other members of her family survived. 
in January of 1946 and emigrated to the United States where her fiance, uh, Sandra Klein lived. The couple married and lived in Washington, DC and Bloomington, Indiana before moving to Louisville where Sandy had a teaching position and here they raised four children and passed away in 2012. I got a job in Washington, D.C. to do alteration at Garfinkel Department Store. And you had to fill out the application and they ask what religion you are. I think I wrote down, or I might put a dash, but I was very worried about that. You know, I thought to myself, this country is a safe country, and it's a free country, and why do they want to know what could be the result of it? So for a very long time, for years, I worked in that place, and I was afraid that they're going to ask me what church I go to. I wouldn't have lied to them. But it concerned me that this should be a topic of conversation and what could be the result if they find out that I'm Jewish. And that worried me for a long, long time. I thought that in this country, everything is free. In Louisville, Kentucky, I was terribly disappointed at one time. I met a young Jewish couple who invited us to their house. And they seemed like they were prejudiced against Blacks from that talk. And I couldn't believe it. I could not understand it as of today. And I know there are very many Jewish people who are prejudiced toward Black. I couldn't believe that anybody who is persecuted themselves, how can they be prejudiced toward somebody else? And this was, that was a theme that several of the survivors um, visited during the interviews this, how how did, just their shock at coming to a society that was um, where they believed that there it was everything was free and we were there was no racial uh, discrimination and there was that that it was a society that had had kind of uh, evolved beyond prejudice and they discovered that that was not the case at all um, and this is someone who devoted uh, his career to civil rights, much of it. Um, this is John Rosenberg, who was born in Magdeburg, Germany in 1931. In 1938, his family was ordered to leave the country. And after a year in a detention camp um, that was actually in Holland, John's family obtained passage to the United States. They were on the last ship to leave Holland before war broke out. Through most of the 1960s, so John lived in the, in the South mostly after he came to the United States, um, South Carolina, North Carolina. And then through most of the 1960s, he worked for the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, and he was involved in many crucial cases regarding desegregation and voting rights for African Americans in the South. In 1970, John and his wife, Jean, moved to Prestonsburg, and there John helped to establish a public interest law firm which focused on systemic issues of poverty in Appalachia and provided free legal aid, free legal representation to poor persons. Known as Apple Red, John served as its director for over 30 years, and he's now in his 90s and still very active. Um, in various civil rights uh, causes and environmental causes. When Magdeburg, the night that the Kristana happened, and when the stormtroopers came to the house and routed us out that night, they brought us into the courtyard. Mother, she asked somebody whether they're going to kill us, and he said they didn't know. And then they dynamited the temple, and they bought all the religious scrolls and all the books, 
out into the courtyard and burned them. That's what I can remember very vividly in all that stuff. Burn up. So he was a young child at the time, and this is November 1938 when uh, the Nazis across Germany um, uh, attacked Jewish businesses and broke broke uh, glass and burned synagogues and uh, burned books and so forth. <laughs> I'm sure that my history and the persecution that Jews had in them, what we went through as a family and as Jews had a lot to do with my wanting to participate in the civil rights movement. I mean, it was essentially the same thing in a different way. I mean, it's mistreatment of blacks, maybe it isn't genocide, but there were certainly the lynching periods when many blacks were killed not in the scale that we're used to here, that was true in the Holocaust. But I think it's the same thing that helped to motivate me to work there and then work in human services where we essentially were trying to do something similar to that on an individual basis to provide those opportunities so that people are at least even in the courts and that they can find lawyers to advocate their positions which they in the courts which they otherwise wouldn't be able to do last one from john many people in this area really so in this when he's talking about in this area he lives in eastern kentucky no experience with jews at all or Quakers, for that matter. His wife is a Quaker. And so in the more recent years, I don't spend a lot of time at it, but I've been to church groups and talked about Judaism. And uh, I've never been conscious, really, of anti-Semitism here in any major way. I know that people who are strong Christians do feel that if you're not saved, you're going to hell. And so they have a real concern about us whom they may like and they hope we, they don't want us to go to hell. And they would like us, I'm sure, to be saved. Especially when you go to a funeral where they preach about salvation and that you simply, you know, you're doomed if you're not saved and you're looking at you. <laughs> Thank this is Robert Holzer. He was born in Budapest, Hungary in 1929. After the German invasion of Budapest in March of 1944, Robert evaded the authorities by moving into an apartment building that served as a clinic for wounded Hungarian soldiers. Meanwhile, with the secret help of a Hungarian officer, the clinic saved the 400 Jews who lived in the building from deportation. It's a pretty extraordinary story. There's been a book written about it. In January of 1945, Budapest was liberated by Russian forces. And after the war, Robert lived in Israel and Hungary before immigrating to the United States, eventually settling in Paris, Kentucky, on that horse farm I mentioned earlier. Um, Robert passed away in 2017. I just have one long um, excerpt from his interview. This is right after in Saint Louis, Missouri, I was within weeks working for a wholesale jewelry company. I was just a stock boy. And my black uh, fellow workers invited me on weekends to go around with them because they said one cannot just sit at home. And uh, they introduced me to the St. Louis that uh, most people who were born there probably wouldn't know. Uh, I went to just about every nightclub. I heard just about every jazz band that there existed those days that came to St. Louis. And uh, many times in a huge dance hall, I was the only white face. In one of these uh, weekend excursions, I was introduced to a very charming college student. She was black. And we started today. And uh, uh, eventually, 
he explained to me that we cannot see each other anymore because her life was in danger and my life was in danger. And she said, you don't understand just now, but 20 years from now, you will understand. And as much as it hurts me, we have to stop seeing each other. And that was my first big introduction to prejudice, really, on a personal basis. You know, I came from a society that was tremendously prejudiced, and I thought I'm coming to a society that is much more positive about these things. And it really surprised me that there was so much dislike and hatred that I knew could not be erased very soon. So this this uh, photo that you're looking at now is um, was taken at the opening of the the 2005 2006 exhibit. This is home now, Kentucky's Holocaust survivors. That was at the Lexington History Museum, and uh, that's Sandy Klein, who uh, is Robert is um, Ann Klein's husband. And he's looking at Robert Holzer's um, photograph and and bio and quotes from his interviews. I had the opportunity to talk to some of the survivors ten years after that exhibit closed about what that experience was like for them, and. Um, so I thought I'd share a couple of their reflections. Robert Holzer, who you just heard from, said, the Lexington History Museum event will never leave my memory. Meeting my fellow survivors in Kentucky meant a great deal to me. And John Rose Rosenberg said, for many years when I spoke publicly about my legal services work, I spoke as a project director or a civil rights lawyer, but not about the Holocaust because it seemed irrelevant to the subject I was called to address. When I started talking about how relevant the Holocaust was to our lives, I learned how important it was for me to speak about it. Now I speak regularly to school and church groups about the Holocaust. I think that's directly the result of my having been involved with this oral history project. So many of these survivors just didn't realize how hungry people in their communities were for their stories and, until they started telling them. Um, in November of 2005, the Kentucky Historical Society and the Kentucky Oral History Commission teamed up for a symposium on Kentucky's Holocaust survivors that featured scholars, poets, and survivors. Uh, the poet Carolyn Forche gave a talk about writing poet, poetry of witness in relation to historic events, and there was a panel discussion that explored how some Holocaust survivors became involved in the 1960s civil rights movement. And then in 2009, um, our, our book, This is Home Now, was published by the University Press of Kentucky. So this is just a little bit of... of what's happened since, since the interviews were completed. Then in 2018, the Ann Klein and Fred Gross Holocaust Education Act mandated Holocaust education for Kentucky middle and high school students. And soon after this, the Jewish Heritage Fund teamed up with the University of Kentucky to create an initiative to support and enhance Holocaust education in Kentucky by training teacher leaders. And I wanted to just delve for a few minutes into that before we go to the Q&A portion of this conversation. Um, just a few days ago, last week, as a matter of fact, I had, a, I had the opportunity to um, listen in on a meeting among some of these um, Kentucky middle and high school teachers who are, who are using the book, This Is Home Now, in the classroom to find out how how that's going, what their experience of that is, and how their students are responding to it. And um, I was amazed by the responses. Uh, many of these teachers have found the book to be an invaluable classroom resource. Some of them um, 
Well, the teachers commented on how these stories connected them not only to the history of the Holocaust, but also in surprising in ways that were surprising to themselves, to their own, it connected them to their own home state in a new way. A Lexic a high school history teacher who teaches at Dunbar High School in Lexington reported that one of his students had said, I've never felt so connected to history and to the story as I do knowing someone from Kentucky who experienced this. He had, he had done some um, reading about the Holocaust and learning about the Holocaust, but he, it just didn't have the same impact until he realized that this was something that was relevant to the, li to the life of the place where he lived. A Callaway County High School history teacher said that she was blown away by students' responses to these survivors' stories. They were so fascinated by this Kentucky connection, as I was, she said. I never thought that these immigrants would have come to Kentucky. As someone who wasn't taught how Kentucky fits into these larger world events, I think the book is just invaluable. So um, this was a, just a, an amazing um, honor for me to be uh, sort of shepherd, shepherding these stories into the world and to have witnessed um, the, the ways that they've moved people over time and to have had the chance to sit with these extraordinary survivors and, and learn their stories and then to see their impact not only on each other, but on teachers, on students, on community members. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a, an honor to be able to share some of those stories with you today. Thank you for your attention. We have time for questions and would love to have some for Arwen. Who'd like to start? And I can pass this around. Jim? But Julie, do you want to do some? If you could do some. Hello. Um, how many of the Holocaust museums around the world and in Europe have you visited yourself? And what was your uh, impression? of some of those museums? Oh, wow. Um, that's, that's, I have not visited a lot of Holocaust museums. Um, only a memorial in Berlin when I was in my early 20s. Um, I just, the, the, the other side of this coin was um, that uh, I was doing all of this while raising a child and running a farm and um, so after I moved to Kentucky from Washington, D.C., I was pretty close to home for most of my most of my years. The question about um, the, the refugees, as was referred, as you interviewed them as many as as you were able to in Kentucky, did they all have connections to the Commonwealth because of relationships, relatives uh, from their family that 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 uh, brought them into the out of the New York area and kept on going? Some did and some didn't. Um, uh, one came for, a couple came for jobs. Uh, one worked in the Ford plant. Um, one worked, but John Rosenberg came to Prestonsburg to, after Nixon came into office in order to found this this legal aid organization. Um, Robert Holzer came for family. Um, Sylvia Green came for family. So yeah, it was a mixed bag. Yeah. This question is from our virtual audience. What specifically was the reason Anne Klein believed Jewish people were prejudiced against Blacks? What had Blacks done to the Jews, or were they influenced by the racism existing in the U.S.? Uh, that's a good question, um, it, and a complicated one to answer, and I don't, I don't think that I can answer it in a specific way. I think that um, she, she didn't say specifically what, as far as I can recall, what what was said at that conversation. 
and um, which makes which is like a faux pas for me as an oral historian to include that clip and not be able to provide specifics. But I wanted to include it to because it represented something um, that was echoed again and again in the interviews, and it was something that showed how she um, how she responded to the United States. Yeah, perhaps it was much more the racism in the United States universally than simply one group uh, being singled out with that charge. And it could simply have been who she was exposed to when she first came out. I wondered the same thing. Yeah, she's, I mean, people people say things and, and it sounds like prejudice. There's another, uh, Janet. I don't know if I'm right about this, but it seems like there's been a rise. Okay, I think there's been, I don't know if I'm right about this, but I have a sense that maybe there's an increase in the Holocaust denialism, and I don't know if there's any way of measuring that or if anyone's tracking it, but can you comment on Kentucky and whether or not this initiative of, of education has made a difference in that regard? It's hard to say for sure what makes a difference and what doesn't make a difference. Um, I can say that Sylvia Green, uh, who we heard from, who was uh, lived in Winchester, um, had never talked about her Holocaust experiences, not even to her children. And she was moved to start speaking after there was a, a history teacher in Lexington who was questioning um, the historical veracity of the Holocaust. And uh, when there was a group, a community group in Lexington who was saying, we've got to push against this and we really need to hear from survivors, she said, okay. Um, so she started, she talked about it for a, a documentary that was on Kentucky educational television. And um, and this is how her children learned that she was a Holocaust survivor was by watching that documentary. And um, she said, she said something like, I, they, my children were already uh, Jews in a small town. They already had one monkey on their head. I didn't want them to have another um, by having to deal with this, the, knowing the, my Holocaust history. So she really did not want to talk about it. And she was very compelled to talk about it only to work against Holocaust denialism. And I I will say that her, uh, the, the teachers who I spoke with just a few days ago, um, almost all of them said, you know, her story is the most powerful one to the students, like they they really respond to it, and um, so I, th I I think as far as Holocaust denialism and the rise of it, I mean there there rise I think because of the culture that we live in at the moment, there's a rise of all kinds of conspiracy theories, and um, with the way the nature of the internet and then then the nature of our um, political system, it's it's really hard to establish facts so um but i think that the you know the more stories like this get out there the better thank you for the question other questions julie here's another one from our virtual audience what was the most surprising thing that you learned from these kentucky refugees Well, I think because I had come from um, working at the Holocaust Museum for several years in Washington, D.C., and interviewing uh, survivors, um, al almost all of the, inter the interviews I had done with survivors um, had been with people who um, lived in New York or, or major metropolitan centers and um, 
and there was there was sort of a, a sense of like there are certain things that that these people share and so this was, that was something that i mentioned at, at the beginning of the talk that there was there was a sense of um they had they, that it was even in the literature that i had read about holocaust survivors in america there was it was just a commonly accepted fact that Holocaust survivors would choose to be with other Holocaust survivors and that they would not marry outside of the religion and they would not um, have friends who who were not Jewish generally that this was the, and and that they felt so strongly about not intermarrying because um, of the necessity of the survival of the Jewish people and I think um, almost half of the survivors that I interviewed had married outside of the Jewish faith. So, so it was just not true for the survivors who settled in Kentucky. In your experience now having done the interviews and put, put it all together in book form, what is the appropriate age to teach the Holocaust to youth. Hmm. And, and I'll, I'll give a heads up. I taught a middle, school, a middle school, Sunday school class at Second Presbyterian Church in Louisville yeah. for, gosh, the early 80s. And I taught it to middle schoolers. I had a six-week unit on the Holocaust. Yeah. I felt like that was a safe comfort. I, I thought it was a safe place to do it so that they could go home and then talk with their families about it. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think that that it's all about what it is, what it is that you're teaching. Um, I think you can you can talk in to to the level of a child wherever they are, but you have to be very careful about what you say and the the lesson changes or the information changes as as the child's mind changes and grows. Um, I remember the Holocaust Museum um, had a permanent, I don't know if it's still there, they had a permanent exhibit that was for children that was called Daniel's Story that, um, that was just very much geared towards um, language that a child could absorb and information that a child could absorb. And I mean, as far as what what the uh, Anne Klein and Fred Gross Holocaust Education Act, as far as that's concerned, they they chose middle and high school students, and that that makes some sense. I mean, you did, I have heard many survivors say, oh, "I talked to my children too young about this, and it was horrible for them." Um, listening to them and uh, other Holocaust survivors that I've heard speak. They impress me so much with how mentally healthy they seem, uh, emotionally healthy. Do you have much insight into what they drew on to to become stable after yeah. all they've been through? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I, like I think um, Sylvia Green, for example, was was e extremely um, she she was extremely challenged by nightmares and um just had a, had a lot of flashbacks and and it was you know she it was that that whole experience was very hard and that when whenever she spoke about it it would that that experience there would be a resurgence of that so that was another reason why speaking about it was so hard for her um but she as as I think she was in her 60s when she became a bat mitzvah and she learned how to drive and she really had that sense of being embraced by uh, her community and she volunteered in a hospital and that that sense of um, I think I think to a person they would say they would say something about give, the importance of giving back yeah Another question, as more survivors die and the denialism is thriving, how do the memories of the Holocaust keep remaining, in your opinion? Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I know that there, there are 
have been efforts by, I believe the um, Shoah Foundation to, they, they started recording people, hol holographic images of survivors so that, and then using AI so that people could ask questions and actually interact with, with the survivors, it's a version of the survivors. Um, I haven't actually experienced, like, interacted with that myself, but I'm, I'm sure it's a powerful experience for, you know, in the, in the absence of the survivors themselves to be able to do that. And there really is quite a wealth of, um, of recorded testimony uh, in, in a number of archives. Other questions? Hi. Um, I don't know if it's a question or a statement. I'm the daughter and granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. My mother did live in Kentucky, and she's gone now, but she's buried here. What do you do with all that? Um, I carry all that information. I was raised with that. Sandy Klein was part of my family. Um, Gerhard Hertz was part of my family. All of these people that my mother knew in Germany. Um, my mother was one of those people who came over and married outside of her faith. Mm -hmm. um, came in through New York, ended up in Chicago because she had two cousins that had read the tea leaves in the early 30s. They were both gay. It, it, that was the first first target of Mr. Hitler. Um, and then she moved to Louisiana when she married my father. She went back to New York and my grandparents followed her because she was an only child. And she had, she was lucky. She got out through kinder transport um, older kinder transport. She was too young, but she spent a lot of her life denying it, mm. not denying it, but not being able to come forth with it. My grandmother, her mother was quite different. And from the time I was five, she was sitting me down after school and teaching me where to find my hiding place. I mean, it was a very deliberate education. My grandmother was dead by the time I was 15, but she she inculcated in me many of the things that my mother could not at the time. And it wasn't until I was in high school that when I was in high school that they came to me and said, would your mother come and speak about her experiences? And it's the first time that she ever spoke publicly about it. Wow. And, and that changed a lot of things with her. She, she went, she spent my whole childhood. I was farmed out to churches. We would try churches out all the time when I was a kid, you know, because she didn't want to go back to her. She couldn't go back to her religion. And finally, after that moment, she, she said, I've, I've denied my own, my, my own Jewishness for too long. And, and she went back with a vengeance. Wow. Um, yeah, she was a strong lady. She, uh, she got her own parents out of, out of Germany by um, going to the very, there were a lot of wealthy Brit, British um, Jews who paid Hitler a lot of money to get Jews out of, out of Germany and other countries. Um, Hitler did pay attention to money, and that's how my mother got her parents out. She spent three years going back and forth to Germany because that's what you had to do. Hitler made these kids come back. If you didn't check in, um, they would kill them, or they were in more, more danger than they were. And every time my mother went back on the ferry and back on the train, my grandmother would stuff her food with gold coins. And because she said, we've got to have money to get out of here. And so my mother traveled for three years back and forth from Germany. Um, she was a gold smuggler at 17. Um, but when it came time that she found out that her parents were in extreme danger, my grandparents had survived Kristallnacht. They, their house was targeted, the house was destroyed. They were able to be saved. Um, by a couple next door who um, portrayed themselves as Nazis, but his wife was really Jewish, and that's how he covered for her. Um, and that's how she she went to this couple who got her out of out of Germany and said, "My parents are going to be killed." And three weeks later, my grandparents had visas and were in London. Um, so, yeah, amazing. It, it's it's a it's a it's yeah. What do you do with that? I mean, I'm the sole I'm the sole carrier of all of that. Yeah. And, yeah. That's that's such an interesting and oh, huge. No, I just. I mean, what do you do with that? What that's do you my do with that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I have memoirs. My, you know, I've got stuff, and yeah, and yeah, it, it needs to 
go somewhere. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That and that's that's a it's it's a what question you, yeah. for it's a question for you especially, but it's a question for all all of us. Like, what do you, what do we do it with is. this? What do we do with this now? But but um, but really, that intergenerational and your your voice as someone who has inherited that that history is um, your now you're the burden is more on you right well you want to do something with it right. you know you want to stand in front of a classroom of students like my mother did back in 1968 and, and yeah yeah you do you do because it's important yeah not to lose it because we're all that's left yeah you know yeah so anyway just yeah thank you for sharing that thank you for sharing. any other questions this was very very moving, somber, important. Thank you. Thank you.